Good morning, ladies. It's so nice to have you with us again today. Uh, we're going to have a study today on how we can strengthen one another, and it is a continuation of our study last week on how we can uh, encourage one another. So this morning, before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much that you've allowed us to gather again in your name. Not only allowed us, but honored us with being able to gather and read your word and study your word and and especially this morning seeing how you would have us behave as your children. Father, I thank you so much for your word and for, for the, the instructions you give us through these writers who are still blessing us 2,000 years after the fact. Thank you so much, Father, for your love and your faithfulness and your continued guidance and, and interest in each one of our lives individually. And we've had so many friends through the years who've strengthened us and encouraged us in your word and just, just by being our friends. And I thank you for that. And I just pray that you would give each one of us the ability to be an encourager and a, to be a strengthener to those around us. This particular time in our, our history, it seems like there's so much going on in the world around us, and people need a word of encouragement. Father, help us to be able to give them that word, and just bless us this morning with your word, and guide us, Father, that everything we say would be uh, lifting up to those people who are who are listening to this, are watching us, and just just, Father, let us be a blessing to each other and to honor and bless you in everything that we do. And Father, thank you for your gift of salvation to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, the greatest gift we could have. And help us daily to share that gift with the people we come in contact with. Father, may everything we do today glorify you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, as I said, this week our study is entitled, We Strengthen One Another. And the point of this lesson is that not only we strengthen one another, but that we strengthen one another to live as God desires us to live. And we always have a story to start our lessons, The Bible Meets Life, as to how we relate the scripture to our lives. And this week the writer illustrates it with a story about going to the gym and how, what the importance is of not only of uh, strengthening one another in the gym, but also in our Christian life. So here's what he had to say. I was so embarrassed. I was at the gym, but at that moment, I was not doing anything productive. I was lying flat on my back with heavy barbells pressing against my chest. And if any of you have ever been to the gym and worked out, you know what he means. Uh, no matter how much I tried to push, my arms refused to cooperate. The barbells were just too heavy. My arms had given up under exhausted protest. I knew the first commandment of strength training in gym etiquette, but I had broken it, and now I was paying the price and facing the consequences. When lifting weights, you always enlist a spotter, someone who pushes you to persevere and intervenes when and if your arms give out. Yet here I was, imprisoned by the weights on my chest because I foolishly thought I could do it on my own and disobeyed the rules. We also need a spotter in our Christian lives, all of us. God gave us the church to be that help because fellow Christians embolden us to persevere and they can also intervene when our souls are discouraged and we feel beaten up and weighed down by all of life's troubles. As God's Spirit works through us, He uses us to strengthen one another in a world that calls us to follow a completely different path. So that's what we're going to be studying this morning. In Ephesians, for the last four weeks, uh, we've been studying about Paul's letter to the Ephesians, which where he preached for three years, so he knew these people some of them intimately, and had led them to Christ. In chapters 1 through 3, Paul lays out the doctrinal foundation and gives us the theological truths about Christ, salvation, and the church. But then in chapters 4 through 6, he lays out 
the practical aspects of Christian living, which we all need. In chapter 5, where we're going to be reading today, he addresses how Christians relate to our larger society. That is the culture in which we live. And all you have to do is open the newspaper or turn on your TV set to see how much we need some practical aspects of Christian living in our life today. So this, is, to, this to me was a very appropriate lesson Paul lays out. So, uh, somebody says, well, you know, I try to seek the will of God and I can't always distinguish the will of God. And then I heard someone else say, when you don't know the right thing to do, do what you know is right. And we know what's right by reading God's word. And so that's what we're going to be reading today. From uh, uh, Our scripture is from Ephesians 5, verses 8 through 21. But I think it would make more sense if we read. Sometimes in our lessons, they skip certain verses. And um, in fact, last week we finished up in chapter 4. And this week they pick up in... Uh, uh, on verse 8. So I'm going to read the first seven verses in chapter 5 of Ephesians. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly beloved children. That's the first good lesson to learn for practical living, is be imitators of Christ. And live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscene, foolish talk or coarse joking which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving, for of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person such a man is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of God, of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. And then we pick up with our scripture for today. So Pam, would you please read Ephesians 5, 8 through 14 on, chapter, on page 115. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Testing what is pleasing to the Lord. Don't participate in the fruitless words of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what is done by them in secret. Everything exposed by light is made visible. For what makes everything via visible is light. Therefore it is said, get up, sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Okay, it's a lot there. From the beginning, people have tried to convince Christians that we can pursue Jesus while still sinning like the world. In other words, we can ride the fence. You can have a foot in both worlds. How many times have you heard that? Yeah. But that cannot be. It doesn't work. In, in uh, verse 8 here, notice the contrast between the darkness that we were once in and the light we're now in in Christ. And look at that uh, question too. What are some ways our culture calls the light darkness and darkness the light? What are some ways? I mean, the Bible says in the end days that good is going to be called evil and evil is going to be called good. Do you think that we are living in that time right now? And, and how are some of the ways that our culture is encouraging that? Everything online. You don't know what the truth is. You could look at a picture. It could be altered. You don't know. You have no idea what's the truth and what's uh, what's. Um, a falsehood. So uh, the internet and and everyone from the as soon as they learn how to punch the buttons, the kids, the kids are kids. Yeah. Right. What about just the the basic covenant that God set up with man about marriage? Oh gosh, yeah. Right. How does our culture <laughs> look at marriage? Well, they don't think that's necessary yeah. because they think that. Um, 
You need to live with somebody for a while to find out what you're getting. So yeah. see if it's going to work. There's yeah. no commitment. And uh, in some cases, because kids have seen how their parents' marriage didn't work out, they don't want to go into that experience or the cost of a divorce. I've heard divorce is too expensive. So why shouldn't we just live together? And um, Satan has this gradual way of introducing sin as it's okay. But it's like putting a little poison in your drink. You know, it may take you a little while to die, but eventually you're going to die works. from it. Yeah. Yeah. And sin is an accepted way of life because so many people are unchurched. They don't read their Bibles. They don't watch any kind of teaching on television or radio. And if there are discussions... Um, it's like, it's their own opinions. It's man's opinion. They don't have any input from God's side of the picture. I was watching, um, I think it was Sunday afternoon, the golf tournament that was on. I had the TV on and the golf tournament was on. And the, the guy who won is a very well-known golfer. And sports figures have such an influence on yes. our, the younger generation. Yes. And after he won, you know, how the wife and the children usually come out and greet them. Well. It, there, weren't, there, there weren't a lot of people in the galleys, but his live-in came on, and the announcer almost said his wife, but then he stopped. He didn't know what to say, and finally he ended up saying his fiancé with their two young children at home in Florida. So what kind of example does that exactly. set for our young people? I mean, it's acceptable. Every time you turn on the TV, the TV shows, it just, just that very basic. And that was the original covenant That's that right. God made with man, marriage. I think, I think it's so, um, especially on TV and the Internet, and they make it so every place you look, every commercial has a gay relationship in it. Or a, right, and, right. And that it, you get to the point, yes, that, that especially kids realize it's just normal. It's just that's right. it's what they see all the that's time, right. so that's there's that's no wrong. what's wrong with it. And then they say, you're just old-fashioned. Yeah. yeah. You're just, yeah. You don't you're know just a prude. I was yeah. surprised when I moved into Sun City how many of these elderly couples live together, are living together. Yeah. You know, I was really I don't think that way. Right. Yeah. I had just assumed that everybody that I was And they said they do it for financial reasons. Yeah. Yes, so that, that's the main one for financial reasons. Yes, well, what about, okay, what about this uh, transgender issue? Right. Now, to me, if someone says, I might look like a boy, but I'm really a girl at heart, you're saying, God, you made a mistake. No, that's in essence. That's you know, put, yeah. you know, just the putting your finger in God's face, you made a mistake, so... I know better. I'm going to change it. And from all the statistics, most cases where this is done ends up very badly. Oh, yes. Because psychologically, you yeah. have so much well, to do with. parents want to be the good, the modern, modern yes, yeah. right. family. So yeah. when their two-year-old boy puts on a prince's dresses, right. he yeah. must be... Yeah. I know when so. the child doesn't even know any yeah. different, they yeah. push them. And it's just, it, it, that's, that's some of the things that I thought about when I was reading this about the difference between light and dark. Yes. Lightness and dark and good and evil. Right. And it, it just permeates. Uh, it's, it's amazing because even five years ago, we would have oh, been yeah. just, you know, five years ago. Stuff yeah. Like this. But that just goes to show, we've talked before about the frog in the kettle. Yep. You put that frog yep. in that kettle and he'll cook to death. Yeah. Yep. And yep. so when, he, when Satan introduces stuff, it's a little at a time. And, and when he can get you to laugh at sin and enjoy a program that's got a lot of sinful right. things in it, he's got Right. You. Well, garbage in, garbage out. Yes. How many times? Just like computer. Your brain, your brain is even smarter than a computer. Right. They talk about artificial intelligence. Yes. God gave us our intellect, right. and it uh, the computer is based on our intellect. I mean, we are smarter than that computer, and when you put garbage in there, you get garbage out. That's when you right. put garbage in here, you get garbage out. That's right. And that, so this, that's why I thought this lesson was so relevant with because it deals with how we live as Christians in an ungodly world. Exactly. And that, that, that's, that's the whole purpose is, Bonnie, would you read that paragraph that starts with challenge and, and cover those two bullet points there? The challenge of holiness is seen in the twofold opposition we face. First, we battle temptation from the inside, 
from our own hearts. Each of us has sinful desires that come from our own sin nature. You and I may have different struggles and long for different things, but the old self still draws us to sin. Number two, we face temptations from the outside, from the sinful world. Others lure us to compromise our faith by participating in things God opposes. Okay, that raises two issues. The temptation from inside our own hearts. And that reminds me of the question that we had Wednesday night when Kevin asked, you know, mm -hmm. can you trust your heart? And the other temptations from the outside are from the culture that we live in. Which do you think is stronger? The inward temptation or the outward temptation? And do you think they're related? It's a tough one. Out, outside, you're, you're having to <laughs> face your decision with someone else there. They're saying, let's go do something that we shouldn't be doing. And that peer pressure is tough. Yeah. I think it kind of goes hand in hand. Because yeah. you wouldn't do it if you didn't have that little bit of desire to do it, I think. They're just curiosity. pulling curiosity. Yeah. Right. Well, I think, right. and I think sometimes, I think, it depends on the person, I think, of, of how social you are and how much influence your friends or your culture has on your life compared to if, if, you're, if you're sort of an introvert and you're at home and, and you think sometimes, where did these thoughts come from, right. these temptations, these thoughts? And, and they can be... Um, they can be related because you see something on TV and, and it, I mean, just the sexual scenes alone that you see on TV now. Remember the 50s when I Love Lucy came on separate and they were married bed. and yeah. they, they had to sleep in separate beds. Well, now, you know, the sky's the limit. Yeah. And I wonder how many times people innocently start watching some of these supposedly safe sitcoms mm -hmm. or, or whatever. And one thing leads to another, and before you in it, you before you know it, you're into pornography. Exactly. And they say that pornography is rampant in the Christian community, and I I just I don't I, I don't understand. Well, so it's not easy to do now and to do in secret. You don't have to go oh, buy a magazine. It's right. You can just get it on your phone. I I thought I remember Kevin or uh, mentioning at some point that even in the church pornography because it's so available yeah. is is rampant yeah yeah, yeah that, that's that's well, what i've heard do too. It in private and no one not, knows and it's not just men oh and no, boys and, and, and girls and yeah. and they mm -hmm. say that they can just pop up on your smartphone yeah, yeah. you can be doing something completely innocent yeah. and all of a sudden it's these there. pictures yeah. pop it, up it, on your even smartphone. websites i was looking for flowers on on uh, googling them and something popped up. So, whoa, wait, kids, you know, yeah. got, got out of there. It's almost like but somebody else has, is trying to control your mind. Yeah. That was happening yeah. also last year with kids being homeschooled, that hackers were in there interjecting uh, pornography. So, yeah, a lot of these kids are home alone now. Two yeah. Of, two of my right. own granddaughters yeah. are home alone. Speaking of what speaking of what comes up on the computer, like you said, there when they're home alone, I heard something on the news last week that there's some school district, and I think it was in Tennessee, for homeschool parents, yes. they had to sign a release that they would not be in the room when their kids oh. were watching these online programs. And I thought no way, I would no have way. said, forget it. This That's is my right. home and my child, and what you're teaching, I have a I have a right to know. Yeah, right. So maybe maybe there's some good can come from this. God's showing parents how their children have been being indoctrinated right. for years right. because of what they're being taught Absolutely. in the schools. It's so important <clears throat> that we are alert as to what's going Amen. on, not only in our lives, but our children's and our grandchildren's right. lives because it's so easy. That temptation is just right there, and it looks so enticing. Well, it does. In the, and I just read this week, too, which I you know this, but you forget it. Sin is not a matter of behavior. Sin is an issue of the heart. Yes. Our hearts are desperately wicked. Yes. You can know them, and God knows. And we yeah. don't even know our own heart, how far we would go with something. That's right. Yeah. So. There was a, a, a radio program, a Christian one, years ago, and uh, they had this woman on that was talked about uh, her 
how she was raising her daughter. She started it young, just when she was first able to talk, talking about saying no to someone doing uh, a boy, a young touching, boy yeah, touching yeah, her, whatever. Yeah. It was constant from the time she could understand that all the way through. She said, I wanted to be, we had drawn a line in the sand and right. that was as far, you know, yeah. holding hands was it. And I don't even, I'm not even sure that was even. Yeah. Um, it's so important. Yeah. But it got, so when that young girl grew up and was, was faced with that, it was so in, in brain. her brain yeah. that, yeah. that there was no problem with her saying yeah. no. no. We parents but, have but definitely. We don't normally yeah. do that yeah. with our kids. I was going to say, yeah. we parents have desperately um, failed our children yeah. in the way we teach them. Because we want to be friends. Yes. And that's not what God, he, he wanted parents. Yeah. You have other what friends. But in our culture, and that's what this lesson's about, and how we relate in our culture, it's important to know what's going on. Right. Um, at the bottom of page 115, I'm going to read this paragraph, and then I want you all to read the bullet points on the next page. Like heavy barbells, and we're getting back to the story that the writer started with, this multi-directional opposition weighs heavily upon us. That's whether inward or outward. But with spotters like the Holy Spirit living inside us and the people of God walking alongside us, we can stand against any opposition. Yes. From the passage here that, from Paul, we see several ways we can strengthen one another in standing against the sinful ways of the world. Joy, would you read the first one and you all just go around and read those. We can affirm the fruit of the gospel in one another lives, verse 9. When we see our Christian brother or sister exhibiting Christ-like character traits like goodness, righteousness, and truth, we should verbally recognize and affirm it. And how many of us do that? No, it's especially with children. your children. Yeah. Yes. yes, to affirm your children when they do stuff right. Right. Uh, we're so, so easily yes. Right. Yeah. Yep. Negative. So it's so easy to 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 correct, Just, but not right. to praise. Right. That's right. Okay, Pam. We can help one another discern what pleases the Lord. Verse 10. We don't always see things as clearly as we should. Each of us brings his own biases to the table, and we can tire, tire out spiritually on any given day. All of these things skew our discernment. We can help one another expose darkness rather than participate in it. In verses 11 and 12. The ways of the world are very popular, and the truth of the gospel is not. Few people enjoy being in this minority, but we find strength in numbers. We can help one another shine the light of Christ, verse 14. It is remarkable how much darkness just a little bit of light dispels. Like a candle, a Christian must be different from those he seeks to influence. Let's help one another shine in the world. And the picture here brought to mind of when we come to a candlelight light service, service. Mm -hmm. and all the lights in the church are out, and everybody, you, each one, lights the candle. Right. And before you know it, the whole room is lit up. And that's the way we as Christians can encourage and strengthen one another. And that, to me, is one of the things that's missing right now in not being able to worship corporately. Right. We miss the support of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. I mean, it's just, it was so good Sunday morning to have one service and see people that I hadn't seen since February. Right, absolutely. It was such a blessing just to be here. That's right. And we need, we need the support and encouragement of That's people right. who love us. And I don't think, even sometimes physical families, you don't have that same love or that tie that you have to your Christian brothers and sisters yeah, in Christ. Absolutely. And that's why that's... that's. And Kevin said there were 85 that were here Sunday morning. So yeah. we're growing. Yeah. It was really nice. Yeah. Okay, Joel, would you read Ephesians 5, 15 through 17, please, on page 116. Pay careful attention, then, to how you live, not as unwise people, but as wives, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Okay, Paul's getting into time here, and, and the writer says that few commodities are more precious than time. We appreciate its value because once it's gone, you can never get it back. 
What distinguishes us is not how much time we have, but what we do with the time that we have. In this letter to the Ephesians and all of his writings, Paul uses a lot of, of opposites to make a point. He uses light versus dark. And, and here he's using wise as opposed to unwise. He was trying to instruct these Christians in the basics of Christian ethics and how they should be living. Now, there were, this was a mixed church. There were Christian Jews and there were Gentile Jews. And we remember how, how pagan the city of Ephesus was. But Paul knew that the Christians that had a Jewish background, they had been raised with the moral um, lessons in the Old Testament. And so they had a certain moral background that these Gentile Christians did not have. And Paul was trying to teach them, put off the old self like we've been studying because there were so many bad habits that they had learned and put on these new habits. And he wanted them to know the difference between wise and unwise but he also wanted them to know the difference between wisdom and knowledge because there is a difference. Both wisdom and knowledge are based on factual truths, but wisdom has a practical dimension that helps us make decisions that are right and moral. And we have decisions we have to make every single day, and every decision we make has a consequence. Sometimes, as Something so simple as whether to turn off the TV set because something on there is, is an example you don't want to see and turn on Christian radio. Yep. That simple little things that we do every single day can make such a difference in their lives. And here Paul is stressing the need to use wisdom in the use of our time because as he says here, the days are evil because the times are evil. If the times were evil then, do you think they're more evil now? How do you think our time relates to the time that Paul was writing to these Christians? I don't think it's any. I think it's always been evil. Yep. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think yeah. we're because of the times we see it more because we're living in it. Well, yes, and and with TV and yes. the computer and you all, you're see around seeing the world. around yeah. the world before yeah. it was your community. Yeah. And we have different kind of idols. Back then, they actually had idols that you could look at and you could see. Right. Our idols are anything we put before the Lord. And sometimes it's very easy to have an idol there and not even realize it's an idol. Right. But if you make it more important or give it more time than you're giving the Lord, then you're making that an idol. That's what I found with this COVID-19. I was so busy, 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 busy. And all of a sudden, that was taken away from me. Oh. And it's like, oh, yeah. You know, I was so busy playing pickleball and table tennis and going to the gym and doing this and this, you know, that I wasn't spending as much time with God. It's well, easy to do. Yeah, it is that easy. Away yeah. And I thought, oh, that isn't, I can live without pickleball. Right. For a while. <laughs> <laughs> And we, we, we find out that there are a lot of things we have given importance in our lives yeah. that we can live without. We might think we can't, yeah. but if it comes down to it. And, and, and so there are, there are differences in our time and our culture and the culture that Paul lived in, but there are also a lot of similarities. Oh, yeah. Well, you look at, as it was in the days of Noah. Yeah. <clears throat> way, way back when, how evil. Uh, it was in violence and sexual immorality and stuff. It just, it, human nature hasn't changed. Well, Satan, Satan hasn't changed. changed. Yeah. Yeah. Satan hasn't changed. Nope. He, he's, he's always, just like God is always the same, he never changes, neither does Satan. That's right. And his main purpose in life is to take as many people to hell with him as he possibly can, and that's what he's working toward, and that's he right. makes it look very enticing. Makes it look very enticing. So, when you read this and you think about the culture that we live in, uh, Paul's warning is just as relevant to us yep. today as it was to the Christians then. And when people say that God's that this is just a myth, that this was written by human writers, that by God's word, that's just Bunch a myth. Of fairy tales. It, yeah, it's just yeah. a lot of fairy tales. No, you look at it. The book has sold more copies than any book ever written. 
and it just it touches our lives and it's just they as relevant to, to us so many times and it's never worked yeah. Yeah. it's never it's worked never and it never will because God has promised that there's always going to be a, a remnant and he is going to protect us and we're always there's always going to be a, a, a remnant there so it's just as relevant yeah. to, de- to us today as it was to these Ephesians that Paul was writing to 2,000 years ago um, why should our approach to time as Christians differ from the way that non-Christians look at their time? Or should it, should it be any different? And if so, why? We should be thinking and doing things that have eternal significance. Because all the rest of this stuff is fleeting. It's, it's going to be done away with. But when we're busy you know, reading and studying the Word of God and sharing what we're learning discipling people and, and telling others about the gospel, about how, how Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that we're all sinners and he came to be our, our rescuer, our savior. And when we push that aside, then uh, we are lost. We are going to be lost for eternity. So we need to, to understand that we are sin, sinful people, that Jesus loves us and died for us on that cross, and to accept him as our savior. But... Um, it's just one of those things that we, um, we're we responsible for our thoughts, our speech, and our actions. And so if we are filling ourselves up with the things of God and trying to serve him mm-hmm. and obey him, then that has eternal significance. And we're not caught up in wasting our time right. doing stuff that right. just doesn't have significance. It's just filling our... our and, and what... What difference would it make in the lives of Christians if, let's just say, uh, every day we said, in addition to what I'm already doing, I'm going to turn that TV off for an hour. And that hour, I'm going to spend in God's Word, praying and seeking His will and what He wants me to do. Just an hour. Just an extra hour out of the day. We all have the same amount of hours. And... Probably for the next week, I'm not even going to remember what I saw on TV today. But decisions that I make for helping other people, I might not remember them, but God does. And they have significance. They have eternal significance. And I think that, Bonnie, with the Bible study we went through, the self-confrontational, the question you kept asking, when you have to make a decision, ask yourself, does it have eternal significance. And what would God want me to do yeah. in this particular yeah. situation? This lesson reminds me of the bracelets people used to wear. What yes, would Jesus do? That, that, this reminded, mm-hmm. that, that, that reminded me of that. Speaking of the self-confrontation, I just got an uh, email from the people that originated this, and they're, they're now going to do the class online. Okay. So if anybody's interested in taking it, talk to me. Yeah. Because it's life-changing. Uh, one of these things that I don't have a problem with, I have a lot of other problems, but this is one that the writer brought out in the teacher's book that I don't have a problem with, and that's the amount of time spent on social media. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a problem with I that. don't have a problem with that. But I understand that that can be a real problem, that you can get so absorbed in social media and laying your whole life out there right. for everybody to see and you taking in everybody else's life that you can just get so caught up in it that... Exactly. That time well, we just went to a flies. restaurant and this family, and, and they're all on cell. I said, "You're you're out to eat as a family." Okay. Yeah. but then yeah. right, all, even the little out. ones, yes. two and three years yeah. old, That's I funny. see in restaurants what with that. I said that well, to the last it. restaurant we went yeah. to. I, I said, Steve, I, look I, at I that. The husband and wife, they didn't even say that where we were in Savannah. Happen. Didn't say a word to each other. Why They're even go fans. out? Why I even? I, a, I mean, the whole social, this social media has affected relationships. Oh, oh, destroyed. It can yeah. destroy. It can destroy relationships. And, and, and anything can be good, but just anything that can be good can also be used for evil. Exactly. Well, yeah, I, would, I belong to a pickleball group, and these ladies text back and forth all, all the time. Play? And I'd be in bed at 10.30, no, at night, oh, okay. and my phone would go bing, 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 finally. I, I didn't know how to turn it off. Finally, my daughter said, Mom, you can put, turn that Silence off. That. 
Yeah. As I said, I tried putting it in another bedroom. I said, I could still hear it. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I think when Paul says here that uh, he, quote, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. I think if we tried to understand what the Lord's will was for our lives, that we would be making some different oh, decisions yeah. exactly. as to things we're doing in our lives. Paul goes on to say that true wisdom is understanding what the Lord's will is. And how do we know what the Lord's will is? Um, I think in, the, in our culture now, and it's been that way for quite some time, we, we feel like we have to, with a microwave society, everything you need immediately, you can't wait for things. Kids, when we were growing up, we weren't taken to dance class and football practice right. and this and that all in one week and do homework and no one knows how to be by themselves or by um, a quiet time, yeah. Yeah. how to relax anymore. I think these kids are going to grow up and they're going to have heart attacks by the time they're 40. They don't know how to just be by themselves and, and um, you know, we can come where are we going to go? What are we going to do? You I know, know. it's you always got to go, go, gotta go. go all yeah. the time. Or, and if they're even home, they're on their games, they're on the computer, they're, they're on, on the board. phone, they're yeah. on whatever. Yeah. They're, they're going. And I, it's a shame. I think it's a lost uh, skill of being. There again, relaxed. though, don't you think that's the parents' responsibility? Well, Their parents grew they, up in that same that same environment, and they don't know how to relax. They don't know how to sit down with God's word, how to meditate, how to how to just seek that peace that passes all understanding that you can only get through a relationship, through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I mean, that's the whole purpose of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And he's given us that gift, and it's there for us. And yeah. we just, we are so ignoring God in this age, in this time. Well, that's one good thing that has come out of this COVID, is families were stuck together whether they wanted to or not. But they're learning to what it's like to be a family again, to spend time at the dinner table together, play, and games. To play games, and just be together. But um, the other thing is how many millions and thousands of millions of people are coming to Christ as a result of the COVID. They're watching these uh, programs now. I mentioned last night in our study, uh, Greg Laurie does these crusades. In this past Labor Day weekend, he did a crusade. He had 1.8 million people that watched it and 17,000 that said they'd made decisions to accept Christ as their Savior. Wow. And that's happening all over. And so, praise God, this is, this is an, an awakening for the, for the world. Yeah. It's an awakening, but we as believers need to be aware that once you make that commitment, you're still in isolation and you, you, you need a mentor or you need encouragement. Exactly. And we need, to keep, right. we need to keep these people who are making these decisions constantly in our prayers that God will put someone in their path because you don't just accept Christ one day and the next day you are a mature Christian. Right. It's like Paul says, you have to grow and you have to be fed. And sometimes in these mass acceptances of Christ through a social mm -hmm. media, these people then sort of fall off and they aren't fed and they don't know what to do as, as, as to grow, how to grow. That's right. And we need to keep that's them. Discipleship we need to keep them. That's yes, why so corporate right. worship and, and mentorship yes. and, 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 and strengthening and encouraging young Christians is so important yeah. because we have to learn. We had to learn exactly. and they have to learn. At the top of page 117, it says, here are three ways Christians should rethink our use of time. Pam, would you start and you all read those, please? Live wisely. Our life matters, so we should pay attention then to how we live. Verse 15, we should use time wisely so our lives reflect the wisdom of God. While the word gen world generally lives only thinking of today, Christians should live today while also thinking of eternity. The world wakes up each morning 
and gets to work on the day's business. Christians, though, prioritize devotions with God before getting started on the rest of the day's activities. Live intentionally. When Paul told us to make the most of the time, he challenged us to take advantage of every opportunity we have to do good. That means we should live life on purpose. Many people mindlessly approach life simply checking off the to-do list and moving on to what's next. But Christians should seek to, have le to leverage every opportunity, every task, and every relationship for the sake of the gospel. Live obediently. Rather than being foolish, Paul commanded us to understand what the Lord's will is. In other words, we should know God's word. And knowing God's word always means obeying God's word too. In everything we do, every place we go, and every choice we make, we should strive to obey God and not to blend in with the norms of culture. This doesn't mean everything we see the world do is wrong, but it does mean we live by a different set of priorities. Yes, we do. Yes, and, and we've already discussed uh, some ways that we can do that, but it's the body of Christ the writer urges us to meet our earthly responsibilities with an eternity in view. And so often we forget that. And I've heard so many sermons lately on the radio and on TV about heaven. Yes. It seems like they're all preaching about heaven and how we should remember that no matter what's going on here, we're just passing through. Amen. We can't get too involved. We have dual, like these people who are born in this country and the parents from another country have dual citizenship. We have dual citizenship. Yep. And our main citizenship's in heaven. That's right. It's not here. And we need to remember that. So there are so many ways that we can honor God with our time, but I think the, the most important thing to remember is when we're making a decision as how we want to spend our time is what would God have me do? What is going, what, is this selfish? Is this something just for me? Or is this something that I'm going to be able to use to help somebody else? Mm -hmm. And that's important. God cares when we encourage and strengthen each other. Our last scripture of the day is Ephesians 5, 18 through 21. Would you please read that one? Uh, who read last? Joy, okay, would you read that one, Pam? And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living. But be filled by the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything the God the Father in the name to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in fear of Christ. Okay. This one I'm sure has had a lot of controversy over the years about being <laughs> drunk with wine. <laughs> How would you explain the contrast between being drunk with wine and being filled with the Holy Spirit? Or in one place, in one of Paul's letters, I think he writes being drunk with the Spirit. I think he compares being drunk with wine as being drunk with the Spirit. What, what's the difference? Well, when you're drunk with wine, you're not in control of your, of your mind. You just can be easily influenced. You say and do stupid things. Um, you're kind of out of control. Whereas when you are filled with the Spirit, He is the one that has control of your thinking, speaking, and your actions. So uh, I would much rather be filled with the Spirit than with the booze. Yeah. That's right. And there's so much in the Bible about being drunk or drinking yes. strong wines. So I'm going to ask Joy if she'll read Proverbs 23, verses 29 through 35. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine. They that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder. Thine eye shall behold strange women, and thy heart shall utter perverse things. Should you go on? Mm -hmm. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, 
and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. So the Bible has a lot to say. That's just one. That's from Solomon, the supposedly the wisest man in the world. And I'm sure he had some experience with right. wine because back then they drank wine in the place of water. And a lot of people use that now. That's why, why the Europeans drink so much because the unpure water and all over there over the yep. years they've gotten used to drinking, drinking wine because it was safer than water. So we can find all kind of excuses. And uh, uh, some of the best commercials on TV are the wine commercials. Oh, yeah. Well, the oh. beer commercials. I used to love the Budweiser. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the horses. The horses. They, right. make them, they make it so yeah. enticing. But yeah. there again, right. they have used something that originally started out for healthful reasons and have turned it into something that is not yeah. good for us and that affects the way we live our lives. I mean, how many homes have been destroyed because oh, of alcohol? And when you start out thinking, oh, this is, this, there's no problem here. I can have one little glass of wine and it's not going to make a difference. But science has proven that there are some people in their genetics, yep. they have a tendency once they take that first drink, they can't, they can't quit. It runs, it runs in their background. I can tell you, you do not make good decisions when you're drunk. No. <laughs> you're speaking from experience. Just once or twice, yeah. Many moon ago. But that is one of the things that now is, is widely accepted by our culture. But too, on TV I used to cringe, like even Walt Disney, you know, when they have what actor or actress drinking and they become drunk, it's funny. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I always yeah. cringe, yeah. you know, yeah. my kids watching this thinking, oh, getting drunk is it's fun. fun, it's funny. Yeah. But they don't see the guy puking yeah, on the, yeah, the, the street. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember as a very small child, my, uh, my, my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, was an alcoholic. And my sister and my cousin and myself, we, we were in my uh, grandparents' apartment in the basement. And my grandfather was in the bed. And he was just screaming about the spiders on the walls and the snakes on his bed and oh, get them off. Yeah. And we thought it was so funny. We had no idea right. that the man was going through withdrawal symptoms right. from alcohol and that this was real to him. Yeah. To us, it was funny. Right. And so many people, as you say, they use this as what Dean Martin, you used to love yeah. to hear yeah. Dean Martin right. sing, but how many times would he come out and slur his words and act like he had been drinking? Because it was funny, because it attracted people. And you said, they said he wasn't a drinker. Yeah. We no, have to really, be. Yeah, he's got a drink in his hand. Yeah, we have to. Show. We have to be so careful yeah. about what we do, because everything again has consequences, right. and we struggle so on some issues because it's so accepted in our society today. Yeah. And this is this is one of the things that are 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 one of the things that's accepted, and there's so many more. I mean, I'm just talking about that because that's the way Paul wrote this, this, this scripture. But there's so many other things that can have the same effect on us. It start out so innocently, and then before we know it, we're embroiled in it. And yeah. we, we are in the middle of being in step with the, with the culture exactly. and not being in step with God. And that's why it's so important that we fill our time with activities that honor God and contribute to the cause of Christ. Because if we're spending our time honoring God and contributing to the cause of Christ, then we can't be making these other decisions that are, no. that are going to get us in trouble like we so often do. Paul further says that when we are filled with the Spirit, we will speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything. When we are drunk on the Spirit, we are going to be thankful, and we are going to be joyful. And remember Galatians 5.22, so easy to remember, and if you have these in your mind, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And that's what God promises us when we're filled with His Spirit. But we have to be, He's not going to force it on us. We have to be willing to open up our hearts and allow the, uh, the Holy Spirit to fill us. And when we are filled with the Spirit, we are filled with joy. We are filled with peace. And there's no room in our lives for fear or depression. 
when you are drunk with the Spirit, there's no room for fear or depression. And we, as Christians, believers, we need to remember that in this period that we're living in. When every time we turn on the TV, people are warning us about another danger or another fear. We have to remember, if we have the Holy Spirit, there's no room for fear. That God protects us. In Psalms 91, he even says he protects us from the deadly pestilence. Right. It's a promise. That's right. All we have to do is remember it and, and live like we believe it. We need to be careful, you know, with the words that we use when you say drunk with the Spirit. Um, the, first thing, the first thing that comes to your mind when you say be drunk it's is wine. Is wine. Yeah, filled. To be filled, filled. with the filled. Spirit. Yeah, um, I was using a little play on words yes. there. <laughs> so you all know what I mean, yes, filled, not drunk. Uh, in this last part of the scripture, Paul uses a word here that has caused more controversy. He says submitting to one another. Remember the 60s and 70s, that word submission oh became God. such a, a, a tender box it's, word it's for the... Word that Feminists would not use, and it was a word that causes all kind of problems right. and controversy. And Paul here wasn't promoting a passive lifestyle, but as Christians, we ought to have a, a, a submissive spirit to, to, uh, to, those pe to our fellow Christians, yes. to our fellow believers around us. Uh, and we only can do that if we have love for one another. And that's what Jesus said, that people will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. And if we have that love and we have the submiss submissive spirit of putting other people's needs ahead of our own, like Jesus told us to do, then we are going to be those encouragers to each other and we're going to be those strengtheners to each yeah, other that right. Paul is trying to get across the point here. Uh, that pair, uh, the writer says here, we don't live in a kind culture. People shout profanities at strangers on the highway. How many times have you had people shout or give you the finger or whatever? People are intoxicated with selfishness, pride, anger, and hate. In virtually every part of our culture, we demonstratively live under self-rule. We shouldn't think our culture is the first to personify such bad behavior. We've always mistreated one another and resisted authority since the beginning. That's just mankind. Yep. We don't want anybody telling us what to no. do. Because of sin, none of us perfectly thinks of others before ourselves or naturally defers to another's authority. And that's what makes this whole scripture so remarkable. As I said before, it's just as relevant to our society today yes. as it was to the society that Paul wrote to 2,000 years ago. And the only way we can live this life is through the Holy Spirit. There's no other way. There's no other way. In question number five, it says, what does being filled with the Spirit look like in the life of a church or a believer? It looks like Jesus. Looks like Jesus. Because yes. Paul started out was when I read the very first thing in, in chapter five was be imitators of Christ. Yes. That's right. Be imitators of Christ. It looks like Jesus. Yes. With humility and love and kindness yes. and compassion. All those things. That's, That's right. what it looks like. Uh, at the bottom of page one nineteen, that statement there by J. Vernon McGee. And I used to love to listen Me to him too. on the radio. There is a brotherhood within the body of believers, and the Lord Jesus Christ is the common denominator. That's right. Friendship and fellowship are the legal tender among believers. And if we live like that, our churches would be different. Mm -hmm. And our churches would be making uh, an impact yeah, on the world we live in today with these rioters. I, I wonder, when I see all these things on TV, where are all of the churches in those cities? Where are the pastors? Where are the believers who are maybe out just letting people see what love looks like? Uh, just maybe being on the corner singing hymns or, or going out to try to tell people about Jesus and, and he loves you. And, and I don't see. I well, don't see any of that. Now that you're talking about that, September 26th to the 28th in Washington, D.C., there will be a, um, Franklin Graham's doing a march, a prayer march, 
And then there's another group that is doing, it's called The Return. And last night, I saw the first commercial for The yeah. Return. The guy that does my pillow. Was very good. Yeah, oh, yeah. Mike Lindell. And, 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 and uh, King. Uh, the na the niece of Martin Luther yes. King. Yep, yep. I saw that too. Alberta. No, yeah. well, that one I didn't see. Oh, you didn't this see that. Was, one. Okay. This separate. This is another one. Yes, but that whole weekend in Washington D.C. are the church churches Christians, and they this is a worldwide thing. They're inviting people from all around the world to come to Washington D.C. because they're going to do this prayer march. And so we need to be in prayer now for those that will be attending. And I think they're going to do it, going to do it in Columbia also. Yes, yes. In our state capital. Exactly. I think they're going to do it at the same time. They're exactly. going to have a, a group. So uh, it is so important that now, finally, the Christians are going to stand up and let themselves be seen by the world and pray for all of this stuff that's been going yeah. on. And I think, it's, I think we need to. I think it'll make an impact. Oh, I do too. It's, I'm going to own the... Page 120 of Live It Out, and they always try to, to show us how we can take the scriptures and the lesson that we've learned and, and apply it to our daily lives. And the first one is through prayer and introspection. We need to look at our own lives and see what sin or temptation is there and ask God for help to overcome those. And influence, uh, how we can be an influence to other people if we see things that are going on in their lives. Be that encourager, be that... Be that strengthener, be that friend that just is That's willing right. to sit down and listen and offer offer Christian counsel yeah. to let them know that somebody cares. Somebody God loves you and this you know, He cares and I care. And if there's anything I can do to help you and invite. Invite another Christian group or a friend to be a part of the fight against temptation. We all have them. Have somebody that you that you know you can trust, that you can confide in that loves you and is willing to be that encourager or that strengthener to you. It said, God employs his spirit and his people to strengthen us against the ways of the world. Let's be sure to let his desires, his desires become our desires and to let them be lived out in our lives. And that's, if you don't remember anything else, let God's desires in our lives become our desires for our lives. Amen. And uh, Bonnie told a a story Sunday morning after church and I thought it fit in so well with these last two lessons that we've had that I'm going to ask her as we close if she will tell that story again. My daughter uh, Debbie called me and said that her neighbor had brought dinner over to them. Um, she had made a Boston or, or, um, a buck and she brought pulled pork over for them. But while she was there she said to my daughter, have you ever um, had somebody come to your mind, even their face come to your mind, and it's just repeatedly, and she said, this happened to me this past week. And so she said, it was a, a man that I had gone to school with, and I hadn't seen or talked to him in 20 years. And um, so she said, I said to my husband, I, I need to call him and find out what's going on. So I called him, and the, the guy said to me, when he found out who I was, why are you calling me? And she said, I was concerned because your mind, your, your name and your face has been on my mind for these, this past week. And he said, I was just getting ready to commit suicide. And um, she said, no, you're not. You're not going to do that. And she said, what is going on? And he said, well, with the COVID, he said, I lost my job. I don't have money to pay my rent. I don't have money for food. Uh, she said, you need help. And he said, I know I need help, but I have a little dog that I have nobody to leave my dog with. And she said, yes, you do. You can leave him with me. And so she said, we're going to help you. We will help you. We'll take you to the rehab. I'll take care of your dog. And they did. And she said, um, since that happened, it was like the beginning of that week, she says, he calls me. She said, I said to him, you can call me any time of the day or night, and I'll be, I'll be there to, to talk to you. And so she said, I talked to him at least twice a day. And uh, so she acted upon that face and that name that was in her mm -hmm. mind. And then on top of it, um, my pastor friend in, in Maryland this week had called me, and I told him this story uh, about this young woman. And I said, they hadn't, they hadn't seen each other for 20 years. He said, I needed to hear that. And I said, why is that? And he said, my son Jared, who's in his 30s, uh, has relapsed into drugs. We have no idea 
where he is at. He's in the USA someplace, but he calls me, and twice this week he has called me and said, Dad, I'm really thinking about ending my life. And he said, I needed to hear that story because maybe there's somebody out that, there that will remember Jared yeah. and um, contact him. So we need to pray for Jared and for Jim and Peggy. Yeah. Um, but for this, this woman that, that followed through right. with actions. Right. And so we need to, and I don't know whether this woman's a, a Christian or not. She may be, but even if you're not a Christian, if, if God is planting somebody yes. in your mind, pick up that phone yeah. and call them. And pray, immediately pray for them, but pick up that phone. And, and that's why I want anybody to tell that story. So that, that, that to me personified what this lesson's all about. Being concerned about somebody enough to pick yeah. up the phone and call. Exactly. So we're going to end now with prayer. Father, thank you so much again for speaking to us through your word. Thank you for our Christian friends who encourage and strengthen us, Father. And just, just help us all to be concerned about each other and, and to love each other and to share our concerns and, and to just be there. Yes. Father, look in our hearts. Show us how to evaluate our lives and see ourselves as you see us, Father. And give us clean, pure hearts, Father, so that we are open to your Holy Spirit in a, in, in a whole new way. Make, him a, make us more aware of him than we've ever been before. Father, show us what you would have us to do to make a difference in this world. And Father, thank you for your provision and your protection, your love and your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.